Hi, Paul. Hi, Dr. Perlmutter. Thank you very much for coming back on the line sure, with you've me. You've been thinking about stuff, haven't you? I have been thinking about stuff. Yes, I have. There's no doubt about it. So we're making this part two of our interview with Dr. David Perlmutter, neurologist, best-selling author with the Grain Brain, and his new book, which is the number one brain book called Brain Maker, The Power of Gut Microbes to Heal and Protect Your Brain for Life. So after our first conversation, we talked the word fermented came out, and then I said, isn't alcohol fermented? Isn't beer, uh, beer fermented? And I started to wonder, how about beer? and our alcohol. Well, uh, alcohol, for example, wine uh, does contain probiotic organisms because it is fermented. There are uh, plenty of research studies that are coming out talking about the fact that these may in fact have a significant role in improving health. But beyond that, wine and even other things uh, that aren't necessarily fermented, like chocolate, for example, uh, contain a, a chemical a group called polyphenols. And what we know the polyphenols do is they act as antioxidants and therefore protect the brain against chemicals that are called free radicals. But polyphenols also nurture the growth of good gut bacteria. So having a glass of red wine each day is perfectly reasonable. Having a couple of squares of high cocoa uh, percentage, low sugar uh, chocolate, absolutely have at it. I mean, we don't have to be that draconian. Uh -huh. Okay. Next question is, and I take uh, probiotics. I, uh, I mean, I take them from a, a you know, a health food uh, store, and uh, and they gave me one that maybe has seventy thousand, you know, bacterial in there somehow. How do I know what to take? Do I take? Is it a good idea to take those? Well, I think probably it would be in the billions what you're looking at. I, mean, I meant to say billions. You're yeah, right. And that yes. said, we're seeing kind of a revolution in the health food industry in recognizing the importance of probiotics. And manufacturers are really jumping on the bandwagon trying to create not just uh, products that have a lot of live organisms at the time they're manufactured, but at the time they are used, that's what's critical. I mean, you don't want a product that has all these wonderful attributes, but by the time you get it home, it's lost its fizz. So you really want to look for products where there's certified number of colony forming units or CFUs in the tens, 20, 30 billion range, even 50 billion, and that that's available to you as a consumer. You also want to look at products that have a wide array of bacterial strains not just lactobacillus acidophilus, for example, but a wide array, as many as, as possible, to really cover the waterfront. You want to try to find products that are free of, for example, fillers, because a lot of times, on, on the rare occasion when somebody reacts to a probiotic, it's not the, the bacteria they're reacting to, it's some of the fillers that are used in the manufacture of that product. Uh -huh. My guy, the uh, Chinese medicine store on, uh, on 78th Street off of uh, Amsterdam here in the city, they're in the refrigerator, the probiotics, and he tells me to keep them in the refrigerator. Not a bad idea. I, I think that for some brands that's actually a good idea. The good news is technology is now creating the packaging systems and the preparation systems that will allow you to buy probiotics that don't necessarily have to be uh, refrigerated. So. Uh, this is exploding technology. It's very, very exciting. And I think now consumers uh, voting with their wallets are going to really motivate producers to come up with better and better products. This is so fundamentally important. Great. Uh, two more quick ones. Sure, take your time. Uh, and uh, I had a product like what you just said it was called the Restore or whatever. That's a good one, too. I did a show on that one. Apple cider vinegar. I, I lost a lot of weight instead of using uh, bad uh, dressings and uh, fattening dressings. Apple cider vinegar. Good item? I, I think that we have to understand that so much has been talked about in terms of wanting to reduce stomach acid. You know, whenever anybody has indigestion, you watch TV in the evening and the evening news, what do they do? They pop a drug that's an acid-blocking drug, and nothing is more traumatizing to the gut bacteria. I'll get back to that in just a moment. We need good stomach acid. Apple cider vinegar is acidic, and I don't have any objections to people using it. We need to maintain good levels of acidity in the gut, or rather in the stomach. What we do know is that individuals who use these acid-blocking drugs are directly traumatizing their gut bacteria and that is setting the stage for, for troubles in terms of health long term. Lemons are alkaline, aren't they? Uh, lemons are, are a bit acid, but they are not necessarily anything to worry about in terms of, of their consumption. I like lemon juice because it does tend to, uh, it does tend to preserve food and it, it really brings out the flavor in a lot of food.
I have the list, the last one, okay? My landlord, we have a very Take interesting building here in downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> we have a bio lab in here, Gen Space, and they're doing a lot of research. And my landlord didn't uh, every minutia detail about what we're talking about here. So uh, this you can answer or not answer. I'm almost uh, having a hard time even asking it, okay? okay. All right. Uh, uh, fecal transplants. Don't have any problem answering it. It's a very, very powerful technique. And as you know, in BrainMaker, we actually talk about that technique. Uh, it is the most aggressive thing you can do to reset, repopulate the gut with good organisms. It's a procedure taking fecal material from a healthy person and planting it into a person whose gut bacteria have been disrupted that's now being performed in over 150 hospitals here in America to treat a particular imbalance of the gut called Clostridium difficile. That's the organism. But we're now seeing research around the world treating other problems like diabetes and even MS, multiple sclerosis, using fecal transplant. Who knew? If you'll note in uh, BrainMaker, I actually describe a couple of cases, one child with autism and a man with uh, MS who were successfully treated with fecal transplant. And we even put video of these individuals after their treatments and demonstrate their improvement on our website, drperlmutter.com. But you, uh, this is, you know, I'm on, uh, I'm on the internet, so, but you need the good sh <laughs> because doesn't, you need to find the right fecal uh, uh, to use, right, that has Paul, low and look, antibiotics, I, things like so that. So that you know, I have heard, oh? I hear you laughing, I've heard every fecal microbiome transplant uh, you can imagine, and then some. Believe me, you, you, you couldn't come up with something that would be new. Maybe you could, but... The point is we got to get over the notion of, um, you know, giving people a lot of crap because it is really a powerful, powerful technique that our most well-respected institutions are, are studying. There's a Dr. Max Newdorp in Amsterdam who has now reversed type 2 diabetes in 250 people by giving them good gut bacteria, understanding that the gut bacteria regulate your metabolism, regulate things like blood sugar. He's reversed diabetes by fecal transplant, and he has agreed to be one of our speakers at our upcoming international symposium on the microbiome. So, yeah, it's funny. There's an ick factor and all that, but, hey, this is powerful therapy, and you will definitely hear more about it, I am convinced. All right, beautiful. I'm going to find out where your event is. I'm going to try to come on down. I want to, I want to see you there. Good. All right, Dr. Perlmutter. All thank right, you Paul. very much for sharing good news with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.